Everybody, I'm recording. <laughs> All right, so placing my hands on my heart, taking that breath of love and gratitude. So grateful for this opportunity to rest in this heart space. Grateful for our willingness to keep this heart space open and receptive. We're grateful for our willingness and desire and dedication to shining away any and all blocks to love in any form back to the root cause. We're grateful for the love and support that this group is and gives and receives. We're grateful for asking all of our earthly and heavenly helpers to join us now, surrounding and supporting us, supporting the technology we get to use to come together, blessing this meeting, blessing all those who are here and all who may listen later, allowing us to have ease and grace, expanding awareness, authentic sharing, we're grateful to be able to share all of these blessings and this awakening awareness within us with Mother Earth and all of her beings because we are one. In grace and gratitude, we let it be. And so it is. It is. Um, Beautiful. <clears throat> all right. So um, we are in chapter 26 and we have never covered this before. So I'm excited. Um, Yeah, I think I'm going to start us in um, near the end of paragraph four into paragraph five, um, where he says, uh, the memory of God must be denied if any sacrifice is asked of anyone. What witness to the wholeness of God's son is seen within a world of separate bodies, however much he witnesses to truth. It is invisible in such a world, which is why we feel separate when we're um, living from this space. And then into paragraph five at the beginning, those who would see the witnesses to truth instead of to illusion, merely ask that they might see a purpose in the world that gives its that gives it sense and makes it meaningful without your special function is forgiveness has this world no meaning for you yet it can become a treasure house as rich and limitless as heaven itself so if we're willing to give up the sense of separation um, through our function, which is forgiveness, then we will be able to behold the whole treasure house of heaven and feel that within us at all times. It's that, that peace of God, right? Which is the treasure house of heaven. So um, yeah, so that's where I'm starting us off. Anybody like to add or comment or share their own thoughts on this section? Kathleen? Yeah, I, I like it whenever the course talks about changing our perception, because I know eventually we're not going to have any perception. We don't need it anymore, but in my mind, if I keep perceiving things in this world that make me unhappy and miserable, then I'm not getting it. So I, I love it when they keep saying, if we can forgive everything, like make it, so well, it's not real basically, then we get to see this treasure house and we get to see God's forgiven world and our actual 
perception changes. We still have perception though, but we just start to see this um, beautiful world of peace. And I don't think the actual objects change. It's just all how we see them and interpret them and give them meaning. So I like the image, the treasure house image. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. I did too. I did too. Ted and then Carol. Yeah, exactly. Um, the the second the second paragraph jump, it jumps right into that, and and I I, I kind of was drawn to that myself. Is that uh, the world you see is based on sacrifice of oneness. It is a picture of complete disunity and total lack of joining. And, you know, it didn't. It, it's it's got to be from from that perspective. I mean, that's what kind of like hit me. It's, if I can find anything that causes me stress or you know sacrifice, you know somebody's somebody's suffering. You know, and of course I only see it as a sacrifice. And as long as I keep seeing it all as a sacrifice, it perpetuates itself. And uh, yeah, yeah, I hit that. That got it for me too. Yeah, thank you, Ted. I know when I read that uh, paragraph, I thought, oh, okay, what's the question, the helpful question I can ask here? And what I came up with is what is the more loving choice? What is the more loving choice? Carol. You know, when I first started reading this course, it was gibberish to me. It was hard. I found it difficult. I couldn't grasp. I'd read the parts that said, I can choose to see this differently. And this is where we are right here. We are choosing to see what Kathleen just said, to see the world differently. I had the most difficult time. I was like, how does that work? And it just grew on me. I just kept at it and it grew on me and I got it. I got it. Now for me, this whole thing is summed up in paragraph seven. Yet every instant, can you be reborn? That to me is like, holy cow, it's big. I can choose in an instant to be different. Oh my God, how wonderful. And given life again, his holiness gives life to you who cannot die because his sinlessness is known to God and can no more be sacrificed by you than can the light in you be blotted out because he sees it not. Doesn't mean it isn't there, it's there. We're just not choosing to see it or in our brother. <laughs> you who would make a sacrifice of life and make your eyes and ears bear witness to the death of God and his Holy Son, think not that you have power to make of them what God willed not they be. In heaven, God's Son is not imprisoned in a body, nor is sacrificed in solitude to sin. And as he is in heaven, so must he be eternally and everywhere. That's here. He is the same forever, born again each instant. There's that blessing again. And everywhere, he is the same forever. We are the same forever. Oh, I'm reading it over. Born again each instant, untouched by time and far beyond the reach of any sacrifice of life or death. For neither did he make, and only one was given him by one who knows his gifts, can never sacrifice can never suffer sacrifice and loss. I, I just like, there's so much hope, there's so much joy, there's so much peace in every part of this book. And it just blesses my heart. I love it so much. It's like eating a meal. It is, it truly is. It's, it's like eating a meal because it just, it's full of every good thing. So thank you. I just wanted to say those words and, and just, Bless us all with them. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Anybody else? 
the talk you could. Go ahead, Nancy Gale. Hi. <clears throat> uh, anyway, um, I, re I read it as I was going to, I take the book to bed with me at night. I read it before I went to sleep. And when I woke up this, woke up this morning, it was like, <clears throat> oh, like, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> it's like, um, it follows on what Carol was saying that was like the insider with like the, aha, uh -huh. I can choose <clears throat> how I want to live the rest of my life. Do I want to keep thinking about the past? Um, okay, to keep it simple was I can choose how I want to live the rest of my life. And um, I can choose to, which, where my focus lies. And it was like, oh, yeah. It's like, it just, we keep repeating the past and thinking about the past. Oh, David, David's, you know, he's, <clears throat> um, he needs, but the, 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 um, the protocol, a treatment protocol for the cancer, it was actually working and the, on the tumors, but the side effect, the major side effect was it, um, it, um, anemia. So he's been having to have blood transfusions. You know, and the first one was five, was a couple of weeks ago and he needed five pints or something. The next one was two. And then Saturday he put a thing on that said he needed two more and they weren't sure they could only give him one. It was, their supply is way low. But then the, the last minute that he got two, but he put the thing up and he said, I may not live through the end of fall because there's the blood, so there's a blood supply, please give blood. <clears throat> and it's like, okay. And the people were on the, coming on the carrying bridge and they're saying, well, I'm this, you know, this, um, I'm a positive, but I'm this and that's this. This is where I live. I can't, and uh, you know, even if they give somewhere where they live, it's not going to get to him. They can't designate it to him, whatever. <clears throat> and it's like it's like making me so angry. It's like, and I can't. And I'll, um, so I went looking, and um, it's in Virginia where he lived, Maryland, um, and where he lives. And so um, the, the website, you know, he put the link to the website their website down there. And I, I, you know, was reading about all that stuff. And it's like, the COVID, it's like you're destroying, you know, people and all that. Well, anyway, and so I'm thinking, well, there's nothing I can do. I for I from where I am, it, we're all like, you know, helpless from what to, to do anything physically really. Well, anyways, so all day, it was like, eh, it's like, and I'm really like angry and all this stuff. And I read this last night and then I went to bed and I said, it was like, what Carol, what you were saying was like, yeah, this is that the hope. And it's like the different, it says the title is the transition, right? And it's like the sacrifice of oneness. The, our beliefs is that we've forgotten the oneness of who we are and who God is and how the whole thing, the whole picture. That's what we do when we choose to follow, you know, to be the individual and that's more important and all that stuff in the body and everything like that. <clears throat> and then I went to sleep and I woke up. It was like, oh, I can choose how I think. It's all in the mind. And um, when we focus on the body, it that's separate we, bodies are separate there's no way we can you know it's even like when you you're searching for love in the partner and all that stuff you're trying to connect with the love in, in, in the physical world which you can't be done literally can't be done you can't join another person literally their body to body <laughs> um but you can join in the mind and it's like your minds are always joined and it's like you choose whether I want to think in a joined way, quote, whatever, or 
just um, or can think of as an individual in my own self. And so this morning I woke up, I said, oh, I can choose. I, you know, and it's like, it's all, I can think, you know, I can be there with him in thought. I can be anywhere in thought. And it's like, and that's all I can do. But what, what, but that's exactly what the, the Course and Jesus is getting us, trying to get us to do. And I said, okay, I get it. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the most powerful things that you can do, Nancy Gale. <sighs> in thought, join him and know his perfection. Join him and know that he is not separate from you and he is not separate from God. Join him and know that uh, he is not a victim of this cancer. He is not a victim of COVID, that this experience that he's having is perfect for him, that your experience of him going through this experience is perfect for you, that we are not a victim of our past, that there is purpose in everything that we have been through. And that purpose is for our salvation. That purpose is for our growth, for our expansion, for our um, learning to forgive everything and just know that it's impersonal. There's, there are no victims. There is no sacrifice. We're just learning. We're just learning to be one, learning to, to be the love that we are, we're born to be and meant to be and always will be. Can I just pop in and say quickly, send him love, Nancy Gale, every day, as much as you think about him, shoot that love to his body, to every part of who he is. That is the healer. That is what's healing my knee. Seven months later is the love. It isn't the shot the doctor gave me. I'm finally seeing that. It isn't that the shot didn't help, but it's the love I'm sending. So love is, is the healer. Send him all the love you can possibly send. Whenever you think of him, send love to him. That vibration is stronger than anything. In mm -hmm. heaven on earth, it's love, love, love. That's God's way. That's the best and the highest you can do for him, sweetie. It truly, truly is. Send it to all parts of who he is. Can't Thanks. go wrong. <laughs> the, one, one other thing that I was, went, before I went to sleep, was like, you know, the, the um, it's talking about Remember, remember who we are, the R-E, remember, remind. And I said, well, what are all the other words? Resurrection starts with R-E. Reveal starts with R-E. Um, relationship starts with R-E. That's, there's this two sides. It's like, re, re, all the words that start with R-E. R-E means, again, remember. It's like, remember, a, do something that you knew before, something you did before, do it again. That's what R E means before in front of a word. I think, whoa. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like all these little facets of that whole thing. And it's like, okay. It's like, hmm. so anyway, that was that's my 500 million cents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. And Kathleen, I could see you singing the Beatles when Carol was talking. It went through my head too. <laughs> All you need is love. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts to this thread or, or want to talk about something else in the... Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, Linda, I could just add, because it's funny, because I was just working with that today as I, as I posted for our healing meditation thing we do on Thursday nights and and the quote I used today was from the ACM workbook I think it was section five it says your safety lies in truth not in lies love is your safety fear does not exist 
identify with love and you are safe. Identify with love and you are home. Identify with love and find yourself. And then it just hit me. Here lies truth and truth never fears. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Yeah, so if I'm in fear, if I'm in doubt, if I'm in worry, if I'm judging, I'm not in truth, I'm not in love. And that all I need to do is ask, what is the most loving choice here? Go ahead, Carol. Um, this really doesn't, I mean, it probably has to do with what we're reading, but it's just, uh, it's just a follow-up and a catch us up on my knee. Um, I, I have had accelerated healing in the last two weeks. And again, Carla has helped me with it. She, when we were at the shore house, she came to visit and we were together. She met my son, Dan, and they hit it off beautifully. Um, but during the course of our time together, she said to me, Carol, cause she was listening to me talk, you know, about my husband and stuff that's going on. And at this point in my life, my kids are good. Our relationship is very, very lovely. The only, uh, the only concerns I guess I would have are, is with my husband. Okay. Um, I love him dearly, but, um, there are struggles there in our relationship. It's not always easy, okay? It can be very challenging. And she pointed out to me, she said, you know, she said, I think you need to work on some of the resentments. I think I mentioned it maybe in, not in this class. You know, the little everyday things. And so if this is a repeat, I'm sorry. Um, but okay, so I gave them all over. And I know exactly what they are. They're just annoyances. They're stupid things that, are now blocks, realizing they are blocks to the flow of love. And so I did, I have to do more self-forgiveness for choices that I may have made early on in my life that were not loving to myself because I was very unaware, but also giving over resentments, annoyances, frustrations, just pesty things, but they're there and I pay attention to them, and I have paid attention to them. So I've been doing clearing work, laying things on the altar, letting go, desiring to allow my husband to just be who he is without any qualifications from me, you know, the great judge. And the healing has accelerated. I've been healing, but it's a slow process. It's seven months. I mean, if I had had a knee replacement, it would have been done a couple of months. I would have been fine, right? I chose not to do that. I couldn't. I couldn't really, with a clear conscience, do it that way. I didn't need a whole knee. And I couldn't see them taking a whole knee out when I only needed a part of it. But because my leg was bowed, the doctor said, I have to do a, a whole replacement. Well, it just, I could not wrap my head around it so but anyway here we are seven months later and yes I do believe I don't know if I've cleared everything out but I'm willing to see what else there might be just want to look in those corners for those dust bunnies or whatever they are to just clear it out be more and more vigilant and aware because there lies my healing because that allows love. I don't know if that helps anybody, but it is certainly working in my life. It truly is, and it is all love, it, it is. I not only send love to my knee, but I send love to my husband and I ask forgiveness, maybe not with him every moment, but in my heart, I do. Because of past stuff, and so I probably need to do a letter, you know, a self-forgiveness letter, which I will do, but the awareness is there and that's the most important. And so I just wanted to share that. 
Thank you, Carol. That's because that my knee is the thing why Amy moved me down here. And I'm choosing I'm I'm following your same so far I've I'm you know I'm saying no. There's a different way. There's the love way. They're, 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 I'm choosing to do the same thing that you just talked about. Thank you for sharing it. It's helpful. Oh, you're me. so welcome. I'm so glad. I'm just thrilled that you're it's helpful. Yeah, thank you, Carol. Miracles everywhere. Go ahead, Kathleen. Well, for those of us that went ahead and got a new knee, it's working great. <laughs> um, no, I was just thinking about the past and that um, I guess we're creating the past right now and then and we get to go into the past to find things to forgive. I guess that's why the past is the source of our salvation. Um, anyway, I just had that thought because I was thinking, do I really want to stop thinking about the past? No, I just want to think about all my great delicious life as if it was great and delicious. And, um, and then there's all these awkward moments in it or hurtful moments or whatever, or terrifying moments, but those are all forgiveness opportunities. I think it's a, I think it's, there's something going on here. <laughs> do we really want to be in the moment all the time or do we want to create a past so that we can go back there and forgive stuff? What do you think? Yeah, I think we're changing our perception. And, and that's, that's how we're healing. I mean, he says in um, paragraph three, he says, to accept the limits of a uh, body is to impose these limits on each brother whom you see. And to me, when I'm looking into the past, it's all about the body. It's all about what this body has experienced for you must see him as you see yourself. So I would like to see myself as perfect, whole and complete and innocent and, you know, perfect love. And so I'm interested in seeing all beings situations as that same perfect love so yeah i am willing to see this differently all of the past to heal the present go ahead phil thanks everyone this this seemed like to me like a difficult one not that i think uh, a lot of those feels difficult to me. <laughs> so nothing new. <laughs> so I'm in paragraph three and I highlighted paragraph three point three. In this perception of yourself, the body's loss would be a sacrifice indeed. For sight of bodies becomes the sign that sacrifice is limited and something still remains for you alone. And the thing that came up for me in this was the body is a communication tool. And this brought up for me, like, it appears like the tool for separation and limitation. And that separation and limitation is created by me because my idly piddly ego or the little self wants to feel important and wants to be right. And so, so that actually, the thought in my head this morning was, you know, if my, if only my daughter would keep her room clean. <laughs> or, or if she only could make her bed and not put all her clothes on the bed. And then I said, here goes the separation. Here comes the limitation. And instead of seeing that, actually, I could choose to say what I want to say to her from that place of love 
and compassion. What I, I of course I want to be right and I want to make her wrong. And that that is where the choice is. And that is where actually the opportunity lies because it is actually helping me to increase the compassion for my own self so that I could look at her more compassionately and whatever I want to say to her, I could say from that place of love. And there is in that place, there is that oneness and no separation. But in the other place, you know, there is only separation. And the, the body being the communication tool, it becomes a separation, tool for separation and deepen that separation. Thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Phil. Yeah, our children are great teachers. <laughs> our children are great teachers. I, and I feel like every person that I have ever spoken to that has been a parent of a teenager has had that same opportunity to forgive the mess in their bedrooms. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Phil. Who else would like to share? Hi, it's Melita. I don't have my camera on today, but okay. um, I was wondering, Phil, then can I ask you, are you going to say something? What are you going to do then? Actually, I decided, which has been coming up more and more for me, as, uh, you know, uh, to work in the invisible and to send love. But there, there are days, you know, I do that. And there are days I choose deliberately, even though I know the other one works. I'm like, no, I, I, as a parent, I need to uh, bring this to her attention. But of course, I can bring it to her attention in a loving way. I don't have to make her wrong. But, you know, when I'm in separation, it comes across more like, I want to teach her. I don't have to teach her because I know, and I know that she knows it because when I say something, she'll say, I know. And so now I say, I do know that you know, and I'm repeating it. But you know, when there is love, there is also that acceptance from her that she is willing to do it rather than when I am in the other place, because that is cementing that separation. So love is, it, love is joining. And that is the joining I desire. And that is what I'm noticing when I'm choosing that. It is actually getting much easier but, you know, there are days when I want to be right and I want to get that. And, and I choose that and I say, okay, I did choose that deliberately. Now, Spirit, I'm done with it. I'm willing to give it to you because that is out of, that is off my chest. <laughs> and I felt good. And then I, before I used to say, you know, there I go again. Now I say, oh, now I, I get to choose. I don't have to choose to remain there. And don't make myself also bad and wrong. But just, just say, okay, it's done. It's over. I'm ready to move now. I don't know, Melita, if this helps, but this is my, my approach to it now. Then what I used to do before never worked. Oh my gosh, so helpful, Phil. Every time you speak, I just soak, soak it up. Yeah, that was beautiful. I was kind of giggling because my daughter, the first thing she said to me this morning was, see, mom, I can sleep when my mess, when my room is a mess. <laughs> oh, I must have said you won't be able to sleep if your room's a mess, <laughs> which 
that doesn't sound like a very loving place either. So yes, like you said, I choose to have another opportunity to love myself and make nicer choices. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much, Phil. Thank you, Melita. Go ahead, Kathleen. Um, and when I used to treat children, um, you know, I was a pediatric physical therapist and I just remember, you know, all these hundreds of kids that I would treat, I always would feel like when I first met them that they were my equal and that there was nothing in that relationship where I was going to dominate. And even though I knew more about the body than they did, I just set such respect for those kids and we would always get along really well. There was very rarely an, an awful um, relationship in there. And um, I quit when I started to feel impatient with the kids. That's when I'm like, I got to stop doing this. But before that, it, it, would, it was all very um, non-role related. And I almost feel like if we could get rid of mother, father, child, you know, and just say, okay, a, a friend has been born to you. That's your friend, you know, and, and now you're not necessarily coming into it with all this guilt of being, I got to be the perfect mother. Uh, which my sister's dealing with big time. Um, so I just feel like if we could just like, like lighten up on those, all that crap that's attached to that word, mother, father, daughter, son. Um, and then we're just all friends. You know, I know people have, can have very difficult children to deal with, um, but still there's gotta be some now acknowledgement that you're complete equals you know there's nothing um they're just a little ball of light like we are you know just a little god ball I, and I, i'm not a parent so i can't really speak directly to having my own kids i'm not sure i would have been that good at it i might want to be right a lot um but being a, a, a pediatric therapist gave me enough um room that i could step back and and do the whole respect thing Yeah, thank you, Kathleen, um, Ted, and then Nancy Gill. Yeah, yeah, Kathleen, I'm I'm, I'm with you there. Um, you know, I I told my uh, children very early on, and I don't know where I le had learned it back then because he's in his fi he just turned fifty. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, parents may bring you know bring you into the world but you know they're not yours you know i can bring him into the world but he's not mine and she's not mine you know that uh and i i told myself that early on early on when they were just little and uh they're both very very independent and um so it, it took takes a lot of the pressure off you know, you, you can't let them get crazy, or I, you know, but it was okay, you know, my son's a little out there, but he's very creative, and I guess the nut doesn't fall far from the tree, you know. <laughs> so. hey, thank you for that, Ted. It's funny because I can remember when my son was in his teens, he's in his mid thirties now, um, saying to him, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> so that was totally ego driven. <laughs> and I will admit that, but it's still funny. <laughs> Go ahead, Nancy Gill. <laughs> I'm with you, Kathleen. When I was the chaplain and, you know, and it was like pediatric, um, um that was one of the units they assigned me uh, um but it didn't matter which which unit i was on my i had access if i wanted to, if i chose to to a, a person's chart a patient's chart and all throughout the whole thing it's like i chose never to look at their chart so when i went in to visit somebody or you know i was on a, a play even playing field with a person I didn't know more about them. I didn't know anything about them except what they told me. So that was the relationship I had with everyone. And it was like, it was like, I mean, even the setting, it was like, I, I loved it. They loved me. I'm bragging and but it was true. I'm just telling the truth. 
I was, you know, it was the, one of the best parts of points of, of my life. And um, I'm telling what people said, you know, I built this, this reputation and it's like people were coming to me, the doctors, nurses, and it was like, it was like, finally, I have a place in the world and it's all I'm doing is just, um, just what you said, Kathleen. And, 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 and that's why it worked. I, I'm looking back at that now and I'm seeing that's just, I didn't know more than them. I only, it was like, and it worked. It worked. So people exactly where they were. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's so beautiful, Nancy Gale. Yeah, it's so helpful when we can let go of those labels of mother, father, sister, daughter, um, you know, all of those labels, like you were saying, Kathleen. Um, I remember hearing Wayne Dyer talk about how um, you know, we talk about the miracle of life when a child is born and, you know, for nine months, <laughs> there's that miracle going on. We have really nothing to do with it. And then as soon as the child is born, we're like, okay, God, thanks for, you know, thanks for bringing this miracle into the world. I got it from here. But really, if we, if we meet them where they are, um, you know, infants know so much more than we do because they haven't been um, impressed upon by the world around them. And, um, you know, you can see how young children are super intuitive, that they know exactly, like, they throw a tantrum when they're having some challenging feelings, and then it's over. Like, if we did that... <laughs> you know, maybe not throw a tantrum in the middle of your workplace, but have some way to deal with those feelings when they come up, uh, you know, and then just let it go, let it go. So yeah, I love this. So helpful. Kathleen and, or uh, Catherine and then Melita. Yeah, thank you. I uh, thank you guys all for the sharing because when you use the word label, you know, right away, it just hit me. It's like, oh my gosh, we do this to ourselves. And it, it comes up, as you say, in these titles we give ourselves, mother, because I struggle with my adult daughter. Um, and, and then it just hit me that I didn't have such a good relationship with my mother and I so desire it with my daughter. And so I'm going, oh my gosh, look at what I am placing out there in the world on her. And no wonder she puts her hands up and says, you know, stop. <laughs> It's like, if I could just be my loving self and just be on this journey of watching her evolve, for she's on her own journey, as was I. And here's where, let the past go. Here's where I see the benefit of it means nothing. It means nothing. I only have this now moment. So I can have it be joyful and happy and be in the wonder of what is happening or I can be sad and morose and feel that I'm not good enough I'm busy labeling myself as well as others so it's a nice reminder today to just be here now allow the love and the peace to just permeate everything and whenever a label comes up or a judgment comes up, you're going, you know, I'm not interested in that right now. Let me let that go. Let me be in love and peace. So thank you for those reminders. Thank you, Catherine. Can I just say one thing? I like the little ball of light idea. That's <laughs> perfect. Go ahead, Melita. Thank you, Nancy Gill. Yeah, thank you. I um, 
I was going to talk about, um, you know, the, the mother role. I don't know. I think, you know, I'm in the thick of it. My youngest just turned five. So as she's tantruming, every time I ask her to do anything is where we're at right now. You know, these phases come and go. And right now it's time to get dressed. Oh, God, I, want to. I mean, I wouldn't be friends with somebody like that. So there's that. <laughs> I, mean, I think you kind of have to have a mother role sometimes or you get the hell out of there because sometimes it's just really hard. And um, with that, that's what I was going to say is I had a couple days ago where it was just chaos. You know, I'm trying to make us all dinner. The kids are being crazy. It's just loud and there's dishes. And I just was so frustrated and overwhelmed and the kids are loud and they're whatever. I mean, they get along really good, but they were arguing about something. And I just thought, oh my God. And then I remembered like, okay, it doesn't matter the situation. It's how I feel about myself in this situation. And so I just stopped and I took a breath and I looked around and I was like, this is freaking chaos. It just is, you know, and I was just able to love myself anyway. I gave myself a hug. I mean, I didn't have time to get away or do tapping or do anything. There was cooking and all this stuff going on, but I was just able to take a breath and go, you know what, Melita, I love you. And this is chaos and this is crazy, but I love you. And this will pass and you're doing a good job. All right, keep it up. You know, and it was just like that in holy instant of a shift of choosing to love myself in the chaos where I wouldn't have been friends with any of those people in that moment. <laughs> but yeah, I got to be friends with myself instead. So thanks. Oh, thank you, Melita. That, that is perfect. Like, you know, the, the most delightful way to treat yourself where you're, when you're in the midst of this is chaos all around me. And I don't like any of these people at this moment and that's okay. You know, because what I would like to have is peace. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to love myself as much as I can in this moment and what a beautiful demonstration for your kids you know to see you uh, instead of um beating up on yourself and looking at the situation as you you're being uh unsuccessful as a parent which it totally isn't it's just you know everybody's having their own experience in that moment um and just allowing yourself to uh, to be in the moment with these people that you weren't loving too much in that moment, you know, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm so grateful that there are parents like you that are learning how to love themselves uh, in moments like that, because I can imagine myself in that situation, um, it, you know, in a, at a point where I was not as aware of what was going on and just like exploding into rage and yelling and screaming at everybody and then making everybody as miserable as I was feeling. So yeah, bravo, bravo, victory. Oh, thank you, Linda. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you're welcome. When I had my son, that was my, like the second I held him in my hands, my first, I thought, oh my God, I have to learn how to love myself. He's going to learn from me and I have no idea how to love myself. So almost eight years later, oh, I've learned a lot. And this, yeah. this these classes are so helpful. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're doing it. Go ahead, Grace. Um, I have to go soon. So I just wanted to say thank you so much to everybody. Today's session has been so wonderful. I really got a lot from all the contributions and parenting stuff, even though my daughters are both adults and now they both have their own babies. Um, it's still important to me to be giving them unconditional love and support. And um, yeah, Linda, what you said to your kids, I brought you in, I could take you out. I'm sure I, I'm sure I said the equivalent of that. I'm not quite sure what you meant. <laughs> But I did try and kick one of my daughters out of the house one time when she was 16 and she refused to go, fortunately. Um, so I have made every mistake in the book as a parent and you could prove in a court of law that I was totally unfit. <laughs> and so 
and I'm probably not alone in that department. My daughter says to me today, Mummy, I've got no idea what I'm doing. She's got a two-year-old, two-week-old baby. And she said to me, I've got no idea what I'm doing. And I said to her, you know, the mother of a baby is the person who's always right about what the baby wants and needs. Even though we don't know what we're doing, you know, we're always right. And, <laughs> you know, I often wish I could have that raising time with my children again, but I had that all planned out for myself to wake up and let them put me through hell. And they put me through hell quite a lot. And um, to today where, I don't know if I'm just in a dream world or not, but um, I just love and adore them and just feel so good, so good about life, so good about the journey I was on, so good about having support groups like these where I learned so much and just, as we're all waking up and learning that we are love machines. We are the generators of all the love that's going around there. And I can turn on my love machine any moment and just blast people with it. And I can see they're just like, whoa. <laughs> I did it to the, guy, the petrol pump attendant yesterday. I just gave him a huge blast of love because he was so sweet. And he's, he said to me, Wow, you are beautiful. And I said, oh, I'll take that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, it's wonderful once you know who you are. We are love machines and we are all powerful and all wise. I'm so grateful for my teenage daughters for what they did to me. And I planned it all out. I'm so grateful to hear that you, especially Linda, was such a brat mother just like me, and look at you now. All is behind and forgiven. And when stuff comes up today to forgive, um, and I was thinking of something I needed to, oh yeah, I was thinking today I need to forgive this whole thing about burning witches at the stake, because we're all one and it's all one time. So I was involved in that. So I was putting on my witch's hat and then I thought, oh, I thought, oh, I need to think this through about witches, but <laughs> and forgive myself for whatever part I had in that. Um, but anyway, all round today was fantastic. And thank you so much. You, you just filled me up. Gracie, did you get your hair cut? I did. It looks great. Thank you. <laughs> Wanted to get that in there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You're I very went well short done. again. This is my usual. Oh, Ted had his hair cut too. Oh, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> I'm sorry. We didn't notice, Ted. You had <laughs> your cap your on, cap. Ted. Sorry. You had the cap on. <laughs> uh, so funny. Thank you, Grace. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so awesome. Uh, that's a, that's a, a hard, uh, uh, all of this is just so hard to follow. Everyone was so wonderful and i love that we're laughing oh my gosh this is really your request of what can we do let's laugh more together mm -hmm. uh, that, that has really just made this lovely container uh and the the uh in in thinking about what people are sharing what came up for me is um the word special and how we have our special relationships and we are learning that whoops wait a minute maybe that's not the way to go we want holy relationships and i think uh thinking about our children you, you know because we do we they are really special and so um just a little tidbit that maybe special is not the best way to go with our children and i'm including grandchildren uh, and because a prayer partner said, well, Robin, remember, we don't want to make our grandchildren special. And I'm like, absolutely. And uh, so it really kind of popped out and went. And um, so there's that. And then before we leave, um, just this little sentence, because again, years ago, I got this and it's just, um, and I, and you all will, will, will have gotten this already, but in, in the uh, book on Paragraph three, sentence six, it says, 
for giving and receiving. There's your RE words. <laughs> um, and um, Nancy Gale. And so forgiving and receiving are the same. And I feel like that's a, a big learning. And to remember that as we are giving to ourselves, being that loving and kind and compassionate mother who's in the midst of chaos, uh, what we give to ourselves is what we're going to be receiving. It's a circle. Giving and receiving are the same. I didn't know that. I thought they were different. And when I found out they were the same, that just highlighted something precious that I could use in my life. And I want to keep remembering when I give, I receive. When I receive, I give. And that's all I have to share. Thanks, everybody. I love this group and love being here. I love laughing with you guys. <laughs> I think we should laugh in all the classes. Most of the classes are starting to laugh a lot. Yes. This Laughter is, is awesome. <laughs> Laughter is awesome. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, it's funny because um, while Grace was speaking, I was thinking, you know, I've talked about that, um, how Pima Chodron has said that a, the definition of a Buddhist is somebody who's either meditating or judging themselves for meditating. I feel like there has to be some kind of similar saying for uh, people who are parents, like a parent is either somebody <laughs> that's making a loving choice or judging themselves for not making a loving choice. And I can, I, I mean, I can remember like my whole family, um, we dealt with a, a lot of our challenges with uh, humor and sarcastic humor. And so, I mean, when my son was little, that's kind of how we, I brought him up. I should say we brought each other up because we really did, but I can remember, um, you know, when he was doing something that was naughty, I would jokingly say to him, if you don't stop that, I'm going to hang you in the closet by your thumbs. And he would laugh and I would laugh. And, but I can also remember like a time when we were in the grocery store and because he caught that sense of humor very quickly and he was, I don't know, maybe he was five and we're walking around this grocery store and he did something like he knocked off a box of cereal from the shelf or something. And he turned around and looked at me and he said, oh, mommy, please don't hit me with the iron. He was joking, but I'm like, oh my God, if anybody heard that, they would think I was abusing this poor child. <laughs> and I can remember one of the little neighbor kids that was over here one time when he heard me say that to Trey about, I'm going to hang you in the closet by your thumbs if you don't stop start behaving. Um, and he was like terrified. He didn't show up at our house for a couple of weeks. And I found out that he thought that I was actually going to hang Trey in the closet by his thumbs. So yeah, thank God we could laugh. And um, thank God that I didn't like completely damage my son, at least with that. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Go ahead. Just, Linda. just real quick, Linda. I just want to say that you are just glowing today. You just look so beautiful and so happy. And you just have this. And did anybody else notice that she just seems to be glowing today? It's awesome to see, of course. And Phil, I just had to laugh about. I was always, you know, I have one older sister. She's only a year older than me. And she was a total slob as a teenager. And my mom's solution was just. I don't care what you do in your bedroom, just keep the door closed. <laughs> and she would just always close the door, keep the door closed. Um, and it's funny because my mom and I have talked about it later on. And she's like, I don't think that was the right thing for me to have done. I think I should have made her more responsible. And it's just, it's like as a parent, I mean, I'm a parent because I have four cats. And you know, Kathleen, that what you said about not having children, I feel like I could never say anything about raising kids because I've never had that experience. Do I still have my opinions? Absolutely. Sometimes, you know, um, but Melita, if you're still on, I just want to say congratulations. Well done to stop in the midst of all that just about brings me tears to my eyes because to love yourself in that situation. I mean, I probably would have turned the, st the stove off and said, okay, nobody's getting dinner tonight. Go to your rooms. 
<laughs> I mean, I don't know if I would have or not, but, and I don't know, Melita, if you can see, I know you said your camera's not on, but everybody has been nodding and, and just saying how much they appreciated your share and Wow, well done. Your children are very fortunate to have such a spiritual mm -hmm. being to monitor to be their mother. Well done, you. We all love you. Oh, thank you, Leslie. Oh, that's so sweet. You make oh, I so mean yeah. it. Oh, thanks. I just don't think <laughs> I would have had, would have occurred to myself in that moment to stop and take a breath and say, I love myself. I'm doing a good job. I'm a good mm -hmm. mother. I mean, that that's impressive. That's like spirituality 501. If you ask me, you're, you're walking the talk girl. <laughs> Thank you. I mean it. Yeah. Everybody's shares were great. Thank you for this wonderful call. Oh, thank you, Leslie. Yeah. That's intermediate parenting for sure. So we are at time. So um, we are going to uh, continue in chapter 26 next week. Um, section two, many forms, one correction. So can't wait to hear all about that. Um, and I'm going to read today from uh, Pathways of Light Insights for lesson number 299, uh, which is eternal holiness abides in me. Because eternal holiness abides in me, it abides in everything and everyone because all is one. By believing that the idea of separation is real, I have taught myself the opposite. I have taught myself that I am guilty and that everything I took on is guilt or will in some way punish me for my guilt. This belief obscures my awareness of my holiness, but by the grace of God, it cannot change it nor alter it in any way. To recognize my holiness, I need only choose a different teacher. In making the choice to listen to the Holy Spirit instead of the ego, I make the choice to become aware of my eternal holiness. He will teach me to recognize illusion as illusion. He will teach me that separation has never occurred and could never occur in reality. The success of his teaching is guaranteed because he is teaching what I already know in truth. He only needs to help me undo the false ideas I have taught myself to reveal the truth that still remains untouched by all the mistaken ideas. He is te his teaching is kind and gentle and loving. There is never condemnation, but only compassionate understanding. He sees the illusion I see, but he does not believe them. As I learn to walk with him, I too will learn to recognize illusions and not believe them. That is my healing and my release. The joy that lies within me is revealed and I cannot help but offer it to all. The, for joy is the motivation to share. I thank you, Father, for holding my holiness perfect for me. Though I walk in the wilderness of imagined guilt and fear, you hold my holiness in perfection for me. You know me as I am, not as I imagine I am. I am grateful for the gift of my teacher in my mind who reminds me of your love and your peace and your joy, which you will to be mine and so they are. As I practice thinking with the Holy Spirit, I remember eternal holiness abides in me. In much of the world, Jesus is a symbol for eternal holiness. What we are coming to learn and understand is that the holiness of Jesus is within everyone the holiness that Jesus represents is the will, is the what we all, let me read that again. The holiness that Jesus represents is the what we all are. That doesn't make sense to me. Sorry about that. Maybe a misprint. <laughs> um, this holiness is our true self, which is one. As we are willing to open up to the eternal presence of Jesus in our minds, we all are led home to our source. We all will remember that we never left the mind of God. We all will wake up from the dream and remember that the dream never happened. Meanwhile, our work now is to open our minds to the loving presence of Jesus. Our job now is to refrain from making any decisions on our own. 
Our job now is to allow Jesus to hold our hand and lead us back to remembering the truth. We cannot hold the ego's hand and Jesus' hand at the same time because they are going in opposite directions. We are the decision maker. As we choose, so we will experience. Jesus leads towards peace of mind and the ego leads towards a conflicted mind. Jesus, today, I consciously choose to walk with you all through the day. I consciously choose to step back and listen to your healing perspective. I consciously choose peace instead of conflict. I consciously choose unity rather than separation. I give this day to you. Amen. Amen. Hey, Thank hey, you. Kathy, Kathy, real quick, Kathy Curie, can you put in the WhatsApp the information about that healing meditation on Thursdays you were talking about? Yes, if you go on to WhatsApp, I put it under the Power of Love announcements. Like I put it in today, and then on Thursday, I put it in a little bit um, before the prayer calls at seven o'clock Eastern time in the prayer room. So okay, I don't think I'm on the Power of Love app thing. Nope, I'll share it in our WhatsApp group. Okay, oh, thanks so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm very interested in it. Thank you all. Everybody, have a great day. Bye, everybody. You Bye. Too. Bye, Bye you guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Much love. Much. Mm -hmm.